Hello, I'm John Molesky, and this is Wilson Center Now, a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. My guest today is Duncan Wood. Duncan is the Wilson Center's Vice President for Strategy and New Initiatives. He's also a senior advisor to the Mexico Institute, and he joins us to discuss one of the Wilson Center's newest initiatives, a special focus on supply chains. Duncan, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, John, for having me. You know, as I was thinking about speaking to you about this, uh, you know, I, I See if this analogy works for you, that supply chains are like operating systems on a computer. When they run behind the scenes and everything works well, we're not aware of them. But if they break down suddenly, we're thinking about it. John, I think that's certainly true as far as the layperson goes and as most as far as most policymakers go. Of course, if you're in the private sector and you your job is to manage the supply chain to make sure that the factory, the hospital, uh, the bank where you work, whatever organization it is, to make sure that that organization has what it needs to operate effectively, then supply chains are a number one concern for you. And for a long time, folks who are actually in the uh, the private sector, what we would say operating at the coal face in the real world, have understood how vulnerable and how important these supply chains are. Um, and, and one of the things that we're discovering as we um, delve deeper into the problems of uh, America's supply chains is how complex those supply chains are and how many different factors and variables have to be taken into consideration when we think about resolving those vulnerabilities. And I think pre-pandemic, you know, the, the term wasn't even in play in a general way, but certainly we've all encountered supply chain disruptions during the last year and a half. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, it really came to the fore during the, uh, the early months of the, uh, the COVID-19 pa pandemic when you know, many things were in short supply, most obviously face masks, um, you know, PPE, personal protective equipment, um, even pharmaceuticals, ventilators, uh, et cetera. Um, but of course we began to see as the pandemic rolled on, we began to see that a lot of consumer goods began to be in short supply. Things that we had uh, become used to just, you know, finding in the stores were not there. And part of it was because of panic buying, but part of it was because of the disruptions to these complex supply chains that, as you say, most of us were unaware even existed before the pandemic. And you mentioned complexity. Another a C word that comes to mind is cooperation, because there's a lot of behind the scenes cooperation that must occur for supply chains to work like well-oiled machines. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, most obviously, you know, we have to have agreements between governments to allow goods in and out of their countries. Um, we have to have uh, agreements between companies, uh, you know, contracts to purchase and to sell. But these are, are, need to be contracts that are uh, reliable, stable, long term. And if you don't have those, if you have a short term contract and all of a sudden it's up for renewal and that particular product is not available because somebody else has outbid you, all of a sudden, the, uh, the, the line of dominoes that exists in a supply chain uh, begins to fall. And you can't do the things further down the supply chain that you need to because you simply don't have the materials, whether they're raw materials or um, you know, partially finished goods, parts, et cetera, that you need to produce the finished product. Is it possible, Duncan, to generalize uh, about the circumstances around the globe in terms of the things you were just talking about? Are things most, mostly working as they should, or are there gaps? Um, there are still gaps, um, and those gaps are being seen in different areas at different times. There's been a lot written recently about semiconductors. Uh, the fact is, is that in the early days of the pandemic, a number of industries that use semiconductors, uh, and most obviously the automobile sector, decided that there would be a drop off in demand for their particular product, in this case cars, and so they cancelled uh, purchases. Uh, contracts that they had made to purchase uh, semiconductors from the semiconductor industry. The semiconductor industry then went out there and said, well, if the automobile sector isn't going to buy these, we're going to find somebody else who can buy them. And so they sold those semiconductors to somebody else. Then all of a sudden, demand came back and the automobile sector scrambled to go and get the semiconductors that they needed. And we're still seeing that play out in different industries. I mean, one of the things about the, uh, the world we live in, John, of course, is that you know, uh, products that you and I take for granted, the refrigerator, the washing machine, et cetera, are increasingly sophisticated internet linked 
um, uh, products, and they require semiconductors. They require complex um, uh, computing power. And that means that if you don't have access to those semiconductors because the demand has been sucked up by some other industry, then all of a sudden you can't produce that finished product and sell to sell to the consumer. Is there leadership in this area? You know, who do we look to? Is it a country by country, industry by industry, agreement by agreement situation, or is there more of a, an overarching uh, holistic view of this? Um, well, listen, there is beginning to be an overarching holistic view of this for the simple fact that, of course, the Biden administration um, and the Trump administration before it began strategic reviews of the supply chains uh, situation for the United States. So we're beginning to have a better idea of the complexity of it, of the global reach of supply chains. Um, but I mean, to be, to be quite honest with you, the real knowledge still exists at the level of the private sector, individual industries, individual companies that actually know the reality of the supply chain, who they're sourcing from, who are the intermediaries, who the uh, people who are sourcing a particular product depend on for their raw materials. That's one of the things that we cannot forget. You know, I think a lot of people say, well, if you can't get a product from one place, you just go somewhere else. You know, you just go online shopping. Well, it's not as simple as that. There's a whole bunch of things that you need to do ahead of time, you know, to, to build in the lag time that it takes to manufacture certain products, which of course depend upon the raw materials being mined or produced in order to make those products available. So we're still, I think, learning a great deal about supply chains. And that's one of the reasons why it's so important that the Wilson Center has embarked on this new initiative to try to understand uh, supply chains. And, and what we've been doing so far, John, is we've been looking at the critical minerals supply chain over the past couple of months. Engaging what, qualify, what qualifies as critical minerals, Duncan? So critical minerals are, are, are minerals that are essential for the functioning of the, uh, of the economy, where we see, uh, you know, uh, certainly shortages um, at, at certain points in time. Um, most commonly, people are talking about obviously rare earth elements, the kind of things that you find in your iPhone, for example, um, that uh, you know, make the, the glass on the front of the, uh, the smartphone tougher, but also sensitive to touch. Um, certain elements that are used in producing computer chips that make them that much faster, that much smaller. Um, uh, rare earth elements that are used to produce uh, you know, industrial magnets that can be used in all kinds of applications. We're also thinking, of course, as well about uh, uh, minerals such as lithium. Uh, lithium being used, obviously, in uh, the manufacture of, uh, of batteries for electric vehicles and for renewable energy today to store renewable energy. These are the kind of uh, minerals that uh, the United States at this point in time finds itself rather vulnerable in, in a vulnerable position on because not enough work has been done in the past from the national perspective to secure access to those uh, particular minerals. And where are they? Who are we relying on uh, to, to, to mine and to produce these minerals? Well, um, the, the simple fact is that these are global industries. Uh, lithium is, a, is an interesting example because of course, lithium is in fact everywhere around the world. Um, you know, there's lots of lithium in the United States, there's lots of lithium in Mexico, there's lots of lithium throughout the Americas, but also scattered around the world. The question is, what is the quality of the resource from which it's being extracted? How cheap is it to extract it? Do we have the processing facilities once it's been mined? And do we have the battery producing facilities to convert that lithium into an er energy storage vehicle? Um, in, the, in the case of rare earth elements, uh, the United States has uh, only one functioning major project on rare earth elements at this point in time. Um, and it's the, the original project that was developed here in the United States, you know, more than 20 years ago. But in the interim period, uh, we kind of lost the, uh, the initiative on that. And China has gone out around the world um, and also, of course, within Chinese territory, uh, extracting rare earth elements and turning them into the products upon which the global economy, the modern global economy now depends. And this is one of the major features of what we're seeing, both from the perspective of the uh, Biden administration's uh, review of, uh, of critical mineral supply chains, 
uh, but also in the work that we're doing at the Wilson the geopolitical component of this. If the United States is going to remain competitive, if the United States is going to be able to provide a challenge to, to China's dominance of the critical minerals uh, industry at this point in time, it needs to actually come up with a strategy to go out there and secure access. And securing access to these elements and these minerals can be done partially here in the United States, but it's also going to require the collaboration of friendly nations. And some people talk about ally shoring as opposed to reshoring or nearshoring. Certainly, I think what we're looking at right now is countries like Canada, Mexico, Australia are very, very important in planning out the future of US access to critical minerals. Is it, it, if I'm hearing you correctly, it sounds as if the United States is in a position of playing catch up. It certainly is, um, but there is an opportunity at this point in time, I think, mm -hmm. to set a, a precedent for the long term uh, future of the United States. There's an opportunity, of course, here, in, as, as there is in every crisis, to rethink what we've been doing. And again, one of the things, if I can come back to the process that we're engaged in at the Wilson Center. Yes, please. One of the reasons why it's so important that we're doing this kind of stakeholder engagement is to really complement what uh, the process that is taking place um, within the administration. We're reaching out to a broad group of stakeholders to try to understand not only what the vulnerabilities are, but also how we can come up with workable solutions and the steps that need to be taken by the private sector and government and civil society to make this happen. Let me just give you one example of this. If we're gonna have access to all of these critical minerals, we need to have a healthy mining industry. To have a healthy mining industry, we need to have long-term investments in human capital. We need to encourage more young people to go into uh, geology, to go into um, anything that is related to engineering with regards to the extractive industries. And we need to make sure that those people receive the support that they need to come through there and that there are jobs waiting for them when they come out. There's a huge demand for this kind of expertise, but it's a highly competitive business. And of course, you know, young folks today who are coming out of college are looking for jobs, not just here in the United States, but are looking for them around the world. If the United States is going to keep its competitive edge, it needs to have people who know how to do the business of mining. That's, that's a lot of moving parts. What is your sense of how engaged lawmakers are in this discussion? I think it very much depends on the lawmaker. We have a number of folks up on Capitol Hill, for example, who have a great deal of expertise. They've dedicated large parts of their lives to these issues. But we also have a lot of folks um, who don't really understand. And they just simply say, well, why don't we reshore um, these mining operations to the United States? Um, you know, it's one of the, uh, the comments that we've come across most frequently in conversations um, with folks who, uh, with decision makers, say, we're gonna engage in a reshoring. Well, that's all well and good, but there's lots of things that you need to do to make sure that that happens. You know, one of the biggest problems that's faced by the extractive industries, not just in the United States, around the world, of course, but especially here in the United States, is the problem of the social license, which is, you know, when a, a, a let's say a company needs to go in and uh, fi uh, yeah, identifies a resource, but wants to build a mine, they need to get all of the, uh, the buy-in from the local community. Otherwise, that local community um, justifiably can uh, oppose that mining project and stop it from taking place. This slows down the permitting process. So what we're looking at is that in the United States, we're looking at lead times for mining projects that can extend anywhere up to 18 or 20 years before you get the first ore out of the ground. That's a real problem. If, we, if we're facing a shortage of critical minerals today, having to wait 20 years to get access to the, the materials that are in the ground is, is really not a viable solution. So we need to think about ways in which without violating the basic principles of uh, citizen uh, democracy, that we smooth the permitting process to make sure that companies can do what they need to do if we're gonna reshore. If it's about going overseas, then we need to have agreements that protect those investments in other countries. So Duncan, you're learning a lot, you're drawing some conclusions. Will this eventually take the form of recommendations? And if so, what's the plan for sharing? So what we hope to do um, by, the, uh, by the end of August of 2021 is having a report um, that we'll be able to socialize uh, with uh, decision makers up on Capitol Hill in the administration um, and, uh, and beyond that really identifies, you know, number one, what the vulnerabilities are. 
Number two, what we think viable solutions uh, should, should be. And that involves actions by the private sector, by government, by civil society. Um, and then to propose that uh, you know, further dialogue takes place because this is a situation which is highly fluid. As we've learned over the past couple of years, we don't know where the next supply chain crisis is gonna come from, but there will certainly be one. And one of the things that we can't just simply say is that we're gonna retreat into nationalism and autarky and try to solve all these problems internally. We need to have a coordinated approach with our allies and with our partners around the world in a very similar way that the Chinese have done in recent years with their Belt and Road Initiative. They've gone out there and they're investing in infrastructure projects around the world. They have secured access to raw materials in Africa, in Latin America and beyond. The United States needs to think more like that so that when challenges come up in the future, when there are shortages, in fact, we have security of supply. No, that, that would be a perfect place to end, but I'm going to spoil that terrific conclusion with because one just came into my mind when you were talking, and, and that is, what are supply chains sensitive to? You know, we mentioned the pandemic, which is historic and melodramatic as an example, but I'm guessing it could be something as simple as weather that could be disruptive. Uh, certainly. I mean, you know, we had a very good example recently, didn't we, John, where a, uh, a tanker got stuck in the Suez Canal. Yeah, yes. that, that's something that's very, very simple. I mean, poor driving by a, uh, by, <laughs> by a captain, by a pilot. Um, you know, can, can disrupt the supply chain. We can also see it in terms of a very simple thing like price. If price drops significantly, a lot of producers stop producing. Uh, that's how the market operates because they say it doesn't make any sense for me to produce at this point in time. Or if you're seeing the cost of raw materials going up, then all of a sudden the price for a particular mineral or a price for a particular product goes up. And if another country is subsidizing their production, then all of a sudden they outcompete you. And if they outcompete you, then that particular supplier in your country goes out of business. Five years down the road, they're not there when you need them the most. So we need to think more strategically about this. We can't just go back to the simple old axiom of let the market decide, because the market is a very complicated thing these days. And we've got major players like China that do not play by market rules mm -hmm. and which have the heavy involvement of the Chinese government in those industries that are really helping to determine prices, supply and who has access. Doug, okay, this is a fascinating topic and a complicated one. Thanks for helping us sort through it today. That was a terrific explanation. Thanks a lot, John. As we like to say, supply chains are hard, and that's why we're trying to uh, come up with a, uh, a, a, an accessible way of understanding them and explaining them. Well, we'll, we'll all look forward to the final report. Thanks again. We hope you enjoyed this edition of Wilson Center now and that you'll join us again soon. Until then, for all of us at the Center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for being here.